Hello, listeners. This is Mike, your host. If you are enjoying these archive episodes, please consider supporting the podcast by going to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, and clicking on the orange Donate button or the Patreon link. Hopefully, with your support, I can continue to release these archive episodes. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You got speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. I feel uh, Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? Here I am, huh? So in that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis and you're listening to episode 150 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 6, Pogo. Following Apollo 5, it appeared likely that one of the six flights planned for 1968 might be canceled. Fewer flights should mean a better chance of landing a crew on the moon within the decade. After reading a preliminary version of the mission report, Apollo program manager Phillips wired the three manned space flight centers not to plan a second unmanned lunar module mission. Shipment of Lunar Module 2 and its Saturn 1B booster to the Cape was delayed, pending an assessment by NASA Administrator George Miller's Certification Board. On March 6th and 7th, the board agreed there was no reason for another unmanned lunar module flight. The first lunar module to carry men would be launched by a Saturn V later in 1968. The success of Apollo 4 gave good reason to believe that the Saturn V could be trusted to propel men into space. But NASA pushed on with its plans for a second unmanned booster flight, primarily to give the Pad 39 launch team another rehearsal before sending men into deep space. The mission would be called Apollo 6. Getting Apollo 6 to the launch pad was a lengthy process. The S-1C first stage arrived by barge on March 13, 1967 and was erected in the Vehicle Assembly Building four days later. With the S-4B third stage and instrument unit computer arriving the same day. The S-2 second stage was two months behind them, and so it was substituted with a dumbbell-shaped spacer so testing could proceed. This had the same height and mass as the S-2, along with all the electrical connections. The S-2 arrived May 24th. It was stacked and made it into the rocket on July 7th. In November of 1967, the idea of putting a camera in the window of the spacecraft to take some Earth Resources photographs had been explored in a review by Miller at North American. George Mayer's MSC mission planners were hit hard by the late inclusion of the camera. Because Apollo 6 was unmanned, all the flight trajectory data had to be correlated with the photographic aims and a computer program had to be developed and fed into the onboard computer. After many careful checks, the mission planners decided that there might be a chance during the first orbit and part of the second to get some pictures of the area from Baja, California to Texas. Testing for Apollo 6 was also slow because NASA was still checking out the launch vehicle for Apollo 4. This was a limitation of the system where there wasn't two of every one and everything. The vehicle assembly building could handle up to four Saturn V's, but could only check out one at a time. 
The command and service module, a block one model with many block two improvements, such as the new hatch, was allocated to the mission. It was similar to that flown on three previous unmanned missions. It arrived September 29th and was stacked December 10th. The command and service module was actually a hybrid of two production spacecraft, consisting of Command Module 20 and Service Module 14. Since Service Module 20 had been destroyed in a tank explosion and Command Module 14 had been dismantled to support the investigation into the Apollo 1 fire. Kleinick, the Command and Service Module's manager in Houston, was pleased with the machine that North Americans sent to Kennedy although he was upset when he learned that the protective mylar film that covered the spacecraft during shipment was flammable. But, in engineering terms, it was a clean spacecraft. Only 23 engineering orders were outstanding, as opposed to the hundreds listed for Spacecraft 12 only a year and a half earlier. Most of these engineering orders were the kind that spacecraft operations people at Kennedy normally handled anyway. After two months of testing and repairs, on February 6, 1968, a Tuesday morning, the crawler carrying the whole Apollo stack on its platform edged out of the vehicle assembly building into a wind-driven rain and headed slowly down a track to the launch complex five kilometers away. En route, Trouble with communications circuits forced a two-hour wait. When communication was restored, the crawler resumed its snail's pace. At five that afternoon, the rain stopped and the Apollo stack arrived at the launch area an hour later. Apollo 6 had been scheduled for the first quarter of 1968, but several brief postponements slipped it past that date. On January 15th, Miller wrote to Webb that the tank skirt of the service module, number 8, had split during structural testing. Therefore, the skirt on Apollo 6 was strengthened to prevent a similar mishap. Then, after the stack had been trundled down the path to the launch area on a rainy day, water seepage was found in the Saturn's S2 stage and some parts had to be replaced. And finally, the countdown to launch practice did not end until March 29th. Now let's consider the objectives of the Apollo 6 mission. Apollo 6 was intended to send a command and service module plus a lunar module test article with mounted structural vibration sensors into a translunar trajectory. However, the moon would not be in position for a translunar flight, and the service module engine would be fired about five minutes later to slow the craft, dropping its apogee to 22,204 kilometers and causing the command service module to return to Earth, simulating a direct return abort. On the return leg, the engine would fire once more to accelerate the craft to simulate the nominal lunar return trajectory with a re-entry angle of minus 6.5 degrees and a velocity of 11,100 meters per second. The entire mission would last about 10 hours. This would test the Saturn V's launch vehicle's ability to send the entire Apollo craft to the moon and in particular test the stresses on the lunar module and the vibration modes of the entire Saturn V with near full loads. A full lunar mission spacecraft weight was not quite simulated because the lunar test article, number 2R, weighed 12,000 kilograms, only about 80% of a nominal lunar module weighing 15,000 kilograms. Also, the command service module was only fueled to a weight of 25,140 kilograms instead of the nominal lunar mission weight of 28,800 kilograms. 
Now, with everything in its place, it's time to move on to the launch. I have an audio clip. Now, three minutes, 25 seconds and counting. The terminal count sequencer is armed at the present time. The sequencer will come in at three minutes and six seconds, where the countdown will be completely automatic from that time down. Three minutes, 10 seconds and counting. Three minutes, five seconds and counting. We have firing command. The sequencer is in. T minus three minutes and counting. Our countdown completely automatic from this time down. However, as reported earlier, the crew here will be monitoring a number of red line values to assure that we have satisfactory temperatures and pressures during these final moments of the count. Now, T minus two minutes, 40 seconds and counting. The various propellant tanks within the Saturn V launch vehicle in all three stages are now being pressurized. Uh, they're primarily pressurized with helium to assure that we will get a good flow of both the lock, liquid oxygen and uh, the liquid hydrogen or the RP-1 fuel, depending on the stage. T-minus 2 minutes, 20 seconds, and counting. Our automatic status board here, driven by the computer, indicates all is still well with the countdown at this time. The pressurization sequence continuing, and we will stand by for further reports. Now coming up on two minutes. Mark, T-minus two minutes and counting. T-minus two, we have confirmation that the second stage liquid oxygen tank now has been pressurized. One minute, 50 seconds and counting. All still going well at this time. minute 35 seconds still all going well at this time the pressurization continuing within the saturn 5 launch vehicle one minute 30 seconds and counting all still going well at this time receiving some readouts on some of these red line values all indications are that everything is still satisfactory t minus one minute 15 seconds and counting third stage propellants now have been pressurized Control, T minus 60 seconds and counting. Clear stage now pressurizing. We're coming up on the power transfer in a matter of seconds. This is when we switch to internal power aboard the vehicle. T minus 50 seconds. We have the power transfer. The vehicle is internal. The complete vehicle is now pressurized. T minus 40 seconds and counting. Our board, our status board still indicates all is well. T minus 35. T-minus 30 seconds and counting, number one swing arm, now being retracted from the Saturn V vehicle. 25 seconds and counting. T-minus 20, still counting at this time. T-minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, At 7 a.m. on April 4, 1968, the Saturn V rose thunderously from its Florida launch pad to boost Apollo 6 into orbit. But that was the last normal thing the big rocket did. For the first two minutes, the five huge engines in the first stage roared and shook the ground and belched fire evenly. Then... There were thrust fluctuations that caused the vehicle to bounce like a giant pogo stick for about 30 seconds. 
the low frequency modulations were as high as plus or minus 0.6 G as recorded in the command module, which exceeded the design criteria. Incidentally, 0.25 G was the upper limit permitted for manned flight in Gemini. Here's the clip. But less than two minutes into the flight, things started to go seriously wrong. The engines were firing, and, and they were vibrating. We expected them to vibrate, and they're attached to a thrust structure, and the thrust structure was being excited by the, the uh, engines, and it was vibrating. Within seconds, the vibration strengthened and began to oscillate up and down the entire length of the rocket. If you were unlucky enough to get the oscillation in the thrust chamber tuned to the oscillations in the pipe itself, then they would tend to amplify each other. The rocket was experiencing a phenomenon called resonance. An example of that is the opera singer in the wine glass where she hits a note that's exactly the same frequency that the wine glass will tingle at if you tink it. And if left to its own devices, the resonance can, in essence, destroy or whatever it is that, that's resonating. And all these vibrations came together all at once and created a humongous vibration that moved all the way up to the spacecraft. Had there been astronauts in there, we would have had to abort the mission because of that vibration level. Our four outboard engines have shut down. After the flight, George Miller explained the cause of resonance to a congressional hearing. Quote, Pogo arises fundamentally because you have thrust fluctuations in the engine. Those are normal characteristics of engines. All engines have what you might call noise in their output because the combustion is not quite uniform. So you have this fluctuation in thrust of the first stage as a normal characteristic of all engine burning. Now in turn, the engine is fed through a pipe that takes the fuel out of the tanks and feeds it into the engine. That pipe's length is something like an organ pipe, so it has a certain resonance frequency of its own, and it really turns out that it will oscillate just like an organ pipe does. The structure of the vehicle is much like a tuning fork, so if you strike it right, it will oscillate up and down longitudinally. In a gross sense, it is the interaction between the various frequencies that causes the vehicle to oscillate. End quote. In part due to the vibrations, the spacecraft adapter that attached the command service module to the rocket and housed the mock-up lunar module started to have some structural problems. Airborne cameras recorded several pieces falling off at T plus 133 seconds. Now, here's the clip for the second stage. Booster engineer reports ignition on our second stage. Our first stage will be falling away shortly. Now it's day's work done. Again, the greatest weightlifting effort ever. Our inner stage has separated uh, this crucial timeline event to right on schedule. Telemetry data intermittent at this time, uh, standing by. Flight Dynamics reports our trajectory is go at uh, this time. Bermuda has acquired our vehicle. The uh, launch vehicle digital computer uh, is now actively guiding our vehicle. Our pitch program, which slowly pitched our vehicle over about a half a degree per second, ended uh, just before staging. We're now in iterative guidance mode one, updating our heading every two seconds, and we're homing in for our target in space at this time. Center engine has shut down. After the first stage was jettisoned, the S2 second stage began to experience its own problems. Engine number two had performance problems at T plus 225 seconds after liftoff 
which abruptly worsened at t plus 319 seconds. And then at t plus 412 seconds, the instrument unit shut it down. Then, two seconds later, engine number three shut down as well. The instrument unit was able to compensate and the remaining three engines burned for 58 seconds longer than normal. The second stage did not reach the desired altitude and velocity before its fuel gave out and it dropped away. Here's the clip of the engine loss. Mark uh, 7 minutes 45 seconds. Uh, we have a preliminary report of a loss of two engines. Uh, this would be engines two and three. However, our guidance is holding well and we're standing by. Uh, we'll stand by for further confirmation of that report. Uh, this is only a preliminary report at this time. Eight minutes, ten seconds to the flight. Our time delay for staging uh, apparently evidence uh, of an engine out condition, uh, but we're standing by for further confirmation. In order to reach the required speed, the S4B third stage also had to burn for 29 seconds longer than planned, putting the spacecraft into an orbit of 178 by 367 kilometers instead of the 160 kilometer circular orbit. Here's the clip. Booster uh, reports uh, S4B ignition. Standing by. Flight Dynamics uh, reports that trajectory confirms ignition. Mission Director Snyder and Flight Director Clifford E. Charlesworth left the vehicle in a parking orbit for two circuits of the Earth while systems checks were performed. Operational tests were conducted and several attitude maneuvers were carried out. Also, the spacecraft's special 70 millimeter camera had been clicking away, getting some spectacular color stereo photographs. These were later found to be excellent for cartographic, topographic, and geographic studies of continental areas, coastal regions, and shallow waters. Then Flight Control tried to restart the S-4B third stage to simulate translunar injection, but the third stage refused to answer the call. The next step was to separate the command and service modules from the now useless S-4B. Since NASA could no longer use the S-4B, they decided to use the service module instead. The service module engine was fired for 442 seconds, which exceeded lunar mission requirements, but it produced the simulated translunar injection maneuver. Apollo 6 shot out to 22,200 kilometers. Although the spacecraft had enough altitude for a good simulation of an Apollo spacecraft returning to the Earth from the moon, the service module engine no longer had sufficient fuel to give it the correct speed to simulate re-entry from a lunar mission. During re-entry, the command module only reached a velocity of 10,000 meters per second, about 1,270 less than planned. But Everything else functioned correctly, and the command module splashed down in the Pacific, missing its predicted impact point by 80 kilometers. The spacecraft was hauled aboard the USS Okinawa to complete its 10-hour mission. On April 9, 1968, a NASA news release declared that preliminary data on Apollo 6 indicated that the spacecraft had done its job well. But it was obvious to Miller and Phillips the overall flight had not been a success. Interestingly enough, Apollo was not top international or even national news in April 1968, even though this flight was a major step in the program to land men on the moon. President Johnson had announced on March 31st that he did not intend to seek re-election, hoping that this action would expedite the ending of the war in Southeast Asia. And, on April 4th, the day of Apollo 6's flight, Martin Luther King Jr. 
a civil rights leader of international stature, was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. So the spotlight was not on NASA. About the only explaining that NASA had to do was to the Congressional Committees on Space Activities, who seemed satisfied with what they heard. But the Apollo team did not need a round of criticism in April 1968. With the decade nearing its end, pressures were already exceedingly heavy. In the race with the Soviets to land on the moon, NASA had flown only two Saturn V unmanned missions and one Saturn 1B with an unmanned lunar module. Now Huntsville had to find out why the Saturn V's S1C first stage bounced, why the S2 second stage turned off two of its engines, and why the S4B third stage refused to fire a second time. Meanwhile, Houston had to determine exactly how much shaking the lander could stand and why a large piece of the spacecraft's lunar module adapter had blown out during launch. Without satisfactory answers, the Saturn V might have to make a third unmanned flight. Now, let's analyze those problems and determine what could be done. First, the POGO. The POGO bounce had been observed, although to a much smaller degree, on Apollo 4, so its appearance during Apollo 6 did not come as a complete surprise. Also, five years earlier in 1963, POGO had threatened to end the Gemini program when the Titan II suffered this phenomena on launch after launch. Its apparent cause was a partial vacuum created in the fuel and oxidizer suction lines by the pumping rocket engines. This condition produced a hydraulic resonance. More simply, the engine skipped when the bubbles caused by the partial vacuum reached the firing chamber. Sheldon Rubin of Aerospace Corporation had finally suggested installing fuel accumulators and oxidizer standpipes to ensure a steady flow of propellants through the lines. This had solved the Gemini launch vehicle problems, and NASA had this background experience to draw on when the Saturn V began having POGO troubles. POGO on Apollo 4 had been measured at one-tenth G, much less than the one-fourth G set as the upper limit in Gemini. The lower oscillation was probably the result of carrying just a lunar test article to simulate the lunar module weight on the earlier flight. But a test article flown on Apollo 6 had the shape and weight of a real lander in the adapter. This change in mass distribution coupled back into the fuel system problem and increased the POGO oscillations. The mission analyst later discovered that two of the Saturn engines had been inadvertently tuned to the same frequency, probably aggravating the problem. Engines in the Saturn V cluster were tuned to different frequencies to prevent any two or more of them from pulling the booster off balance and changing its trajectory during powered flight. The Rocketeers at Huntsville first wanted to know from Houston whether a crew could have withstood the vibration levels on Apollo 6. If so, the next Saturn V flight could be manned even without a POGO cure. George Lowe informed Saturn V program manager Arthur Rudolph that these levels could not be tolerated. Marshall also asked where the emergency detection system could be used to abort the mission automatically if such high vibrations occurred again. During Apollo 6, the system had cast one vote for ending the mission. Had it cast a second vote, abort would have been mandatory. Lowe and Chief Astronaut Donald Slayton did not want to use the system in an automatic pogo abort mode. Lowe met with George H. Haig, Phillips' deputy, and they decided on the immediate development of a pogo abort sensor 
a self-contained unit that would monitor and display spacecraft oscillations. This sensor would be used to help a spacecraft commander decide whether to continue or stop the mission. Marshall Space Flight Center pulled an S-1C stage out of Machode Assembly Facility, brought it to Huntsville, and erected it in a test stand. By May, Huntsville, Houston, and Washington Apollo officials were ready to attack the Pogo problem. Haig agreed to head the activity until Eberhard Rees could finish his task on the command module at Downey and take over. At one time, 1,000 engineers from government and industry were working on the Pogo problem. Out on the West Coast, at the rocket engine test site at Edwards Air Force Base, Rocketdyne started testing its F-1 engine in late May. In the first six tests, helium was injected into the liquid oxygen feed lines in an attempt to interrupt the resonating frequencies that had caused the unacceptable vibration levels. In four of the six tests, the cure was worse than the disease, producing even more pronounced oscillations. The Saturn V people at Marshall also tried helium injection, but their results were decidedly different. No oscillations whatsoever were observed. Test using the S1C stage's pre-valves as helium accumulators were then conducted at both Edwards and Marshall. The pre-valves were in the liquid oxygen ducts just above the firing chambers of the five engines and were used to hold up the flow of oxygen in the fuel lines until late in the countdown, when the fuel was admitted to the main liquid oxygen valves in preparation for engine ignition. The pre-valves were modified to allow the injection of helium into the cavity about 10 minutes before liftoff. The helium would then serve as a shock absorber against any liquid oxygen pressure surges. With a possible solution at hand for the POGO problem, we will move on to the engine shutdown problem. Determining what had happened to the S2 stage when two of the five J2 engines shut down early and the S4B's single J2 engine refusing to start was more difficult than POGO. During tests at Arnold Engineering Development Center at Tahloma, Tennessee, engineers discovered that frost forming on propellant lines when the engines were fired at ground temperatures served as an extra protection against lines burning through. But frosting did not take place in the vacuum of space. The lines could have failed because of this. Also, in the line leading to each of the engines was an augmented spark igniter. Next to the igniter was a bellows. During ground test, liquid air that was sprayed over the exterior to cool it also dampened out any vibrations. Vacuum testing revealed that the bellows vibrated furiously and failed immediately after peak fuel flow rates began. These lines were strengthened and modified to eliminate the bellows. The S-4B used the same J-2 engine design as the S-2, and so it was decided that an igniter line problem had also stopped the third stage from reigniting in Earth orbit. Ground testing confirmed that the slight underperformance seen in the first S-4B burn was consistent with damage to the igniter line. Moving on, another item noticed by flight control monitors during the boosted flight of Apollo 6 and later confirmed by photographs was that a panel section of the adapter that housed the lander had fallen away just after the Saturn V started bouncing. The controllers had been amazed that the structural integrity was sufficient to carry the payload into orbit. James Chamberlain in Houston discovered that thermal pressures, and therefore moisture, 
had built up in the honeycomb panels during launch. With no venting to allow the extra pressure to escape, the panel had blown out. A layer of cork was applied to the exterior of the adapter to keep it cooler and to absorb the moisture, and holes were drilled in the adapter panels to relieve the internal pressure if heat did build up inside on future launches. In conclusion, at mid-year 1968, chances for landing on the moon within the decade were still touch and go. It did seem likely that NASA would have to fly only five instead of six preparatory flights during that year, but one of these might have to be another unmanned Saturn V. Not knowing exactly what would follow the third mission of the year required some extra planning. For example, the Kennedy spacecraft preparation team had to prepare both a border plate and a qualified production command module for the next Saturn V shot. Since the choice for the launch depended on the outcome of the POGO investigations, To further complicate matters, mission planners in Washington revived the plan for launching two Saturn 1B missions to give both the North American and the Grumman spacecraft a workout in Earth orbit if another unmanned Saturn V had to be flown. However, even this plan was tentative as the delivery date for Lunar Module 3 was still not firm. On the brighter side, By mid-year, North American's work was improving. Although the contractor was late in shipping Command Service Module 101 for the first manned Apollo mission, improvements in the fabrication of this machine indicated that future spacecraft should be on time. After a traumatic and pressure-packed 18 months, North American was finally delivering satisfactory flight-ready hardware. When Command Service Module 101 arrived at the Cape on May 30th, the receiving inspectors found fewer discrepancies than on any spacecraft previously delivered to Kennedy. Miller had told the Senate Space Committee in February 1968 that the first manned Apollo mission would be flown in the last quarter of the year. In June, this still seemed feasible. for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.